2 Peter chapter number 1, 2 Peter chapter number 1. And as soon as you find that, stand up with me and we'll read God's Word together. 2 Peter chapter number 1. If there's someone beside you that don't have a Bible, why don't you share it with them so that everyone can look on as we read God's Word today. Chapter 1, 2 Peter, verse 1. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have, have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain to life and to godliness or living a godly life through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and to virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these promises you might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you, and they abound, they make you that you shall be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind, and he cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and your election, sure. I call your attention to that. Give diligence. That implies effort, does it not? To make your calling and election, that's the way it describes salvation. Give diligence to make your calling and your election sure. And if you do these things, you shall never fall. Notice that phrase. Is that not powerful? If you do these things, you shall never fall or fall away from your Christian life in living it for him, not losing your salvation, of course. You may be seated. <clears throat> if you will look there, beginning in verse number, uh, let's see, in verse number 5, beside this give all diligence, add to, notice there are eight qualities, eight character qualities that are mentioned, here is one of those lists of qualities or virtues that you find throughout the Bible, the fruit of the Spirit, you find it in various places, and here's another list of the kind of qualities that God wants to see in the lives of His children. You will notice it begins with faith, having faith in Christ. So that is, of course, your salvation. Everything is based upon the foundation of salvation. And then it says virtue, virtue. And then add to. And so it's like a, it's like a building or it's like steps, if you will. You're adding on, you're building one quality upon another. So upon your faith, your salvation, you add to or build a virtuous life. And then knowledge. You can't go any further unless you know, unless you understand. And then temperance, or that's self-control, of course. And then patience. And you're adding on. Each of these you're adding. You're building on. You're building a Christian character. Add to your patience godliness. And then to godliness kindness. And then the capstone is love. Now, in most of the other lists, love is the first quality, but in this one, it's the ultimate. It's the epitome, if you will. Now, having read that at the beginning of the book, go to the last 
chapter of the book of 2 Peter, chapter 3, go to the last verse. And he is really interested in people growing in the faith. And so he says, grow in grace. Grow in those eight qualities I've just read to you. Grow in those areas and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Notice that's an imperative. That's a command for us. The idea of sort of checking your box, the idea of just saying, you know, I'm saved now, I've trusted in Christ. The idea of saying, okay, I've got my ticket punched for heaven, I'm not going to worry about anything else, and forgetting essentially that the goal of the Christian life is to grow. The goal of the Christian life is to become conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, the Scripture says. The whole goal of the Christian life is not just to get saved and say, I've got my ticket punch for heaven now. The goal of the Christian life is to grow until people look at you, look at me, and they say, he or she is an awful lot like the Lord Jesus Christ. They look like Christ. They're conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. That's the ultimate aim of the Christian life. And so my goal this morning is to help you grow in your Christian life, to help you attain a character that looks like the Lord Jesus Christ when people observe your life. And boy, if we could do that. You see, we spend thousands of dollars a year advertising the Florence Baptist Temple. The reality and the truth is we wouldn't need to spend one copper penny. Well, they're not copper anymore, are they? But we wouldn't need to spend one penny telling people about our church if we had a congregation who, to the man and to the woman, reflected the character of Jesus Christ. I believe people would knock the walls down to come here if they saw people that were unlike the rest of the world's population, if they could see people that looked so much like Jesus Christ that they were actually conformed to his image. So that's my plan this morning in this message. My aim, my goal is to help you grow to become like Christ. I hope you care. I hope you want to be like Jesus. I heard about a fellow who prayed a prayer and it went something like this. He said, Lord, I don't really want to love you and serve you. And he said, Lord, I pray that you will help me to want to want to serve Jesus Christ and to live like you. Sometimes our hearts are so cold, we forget we really don't care. We forget that he actually died on a cross for our sins and has given us eternal life. We forget it. How could you forget anything like that? But we do, don't we? And we forget it. And we put it off to the side and we Make it a low priority, if a priority at all. And he wants us to grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, normally, I don't preach these types of messages, but today I'm going to preach a little bit differently. And the subject today is the six-point plan for a successful Christian life. The six-point plan. I'm going to give you, obviously, six points. <laughs> and you might want to write them down. There may be some room there on your bulletin that you could write them down because I want you to keep them in mind in the days ahead. And I really want to help you grow to become like the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't you want to do that today, church? Amen. That ought to be the deepest desire of every believer's heart. Number one. Number one. Settle the matter of your salvation. It will solve a lot of other problems. Settle the matter of your salvation. You have to start there. You see, he started with upon your faith, then add virtue. I'm starting with faith. I'm starting with the foundation. Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ in a saving way? Do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? I didn't ask you about your church membership. I didn't ask you if you're a moral, honest, reputable person. Because you can be 
all of those things and more, and you can still be lost. Settle the matter of your salvation. If you do, it will take care of a multitude of other problems. It is the solid, sound foundation of the Christian life. You see, many people profess. Look in chapter 1 again, and back there in verse number 8. It talks about people who are barren and people who are unfruitful. The Bible uses that term, being fruitful, a lot. It has the idea, taken from just any orchard or from nature, here's an apple tree. Well, an apple tree produces apples. Here's a tomato bush. A tomato bush produces tomatoes. A plant, a tree, is known by its fruit. You've heard that, haven't you, so much? And it's so true. It's always true. It is inevitably true, inexorably true. An apple tree never does produce oranges. It produces according to its own nature. It produces apples. And a Christian produces the fruit of a Christian. It produces the fruit of a Christian. A Christian doesn't produce the fruit of the unsaved. The Christian produces after his or her nature. And Peter here writing this letter says, I don't want you to be barren without fruit. I don't want you to be unfruitful. So the question for Bill Monroe this morning and the question for each of us listening is this, what is the fruit that my life is producing? Or am I a barren tree? Am I an unfruitful tree? Do I have any real value to the work of God, to the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ? Settle that. Settle the matter of your salvation. Look into your life, and I'm going to tell you, if you're saved, there's some fruit there somewhere. If there's life, there's going to be fruit. One of the favorite verses we quote constantly about salvation is Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. By grace, the grace of God, you're saved through faith. Not of yourselves, meaning there's nothing you can do to help with your salvation. It is the gift of God. Salvation is a gift that God has for each people. It's a gift of God. Not of works. Not through anything I can do. Not of works. Now, so many people really can't get their hands around that. They can't get their mind around that. That we're saved by the Lord without any human effort, whatever, involved in it. Almost inevitably, when I speak to people about their salvation, they will say, well, I'm trusting in Jesus Christ. I believe in Christ. I made a profession. They'll talk about that. And then they'll say, and I'm trying to do the best I can. And, and that somehow or other, they'll slip in some form of works-based effort. Now, I want to tell you today, that is not salvation. You can't be sure your salvation as long as, you're got, as long as you have I in it. Because it has nothing to do with what you do other than you take the gift by faith. By grace are you saved. You see, grace is God's part. He extends his love and his mercy to us though we don't deserve it. No one here deserves it. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Grace is God's part. So what is my part in the salvation equation? My part is to accept the gift. My part is simply to believe. And the word believe in the Greek language had the idea of relying upon, depending upon, uh, to, to put myself in the hands of someone else. It's hard for us, but it's to trust, to put my confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ to save me. That is salvation, receiving that gift. And when I receive that gift, I become a child of God. As many as received him, Jesus said, to them it becomes the power, or they have the power to become the sons of God the children of God. That relationship doesn't exist. Everybody is not a child of God. You have to be born again. 
you become a child of God when you receive the Lord Jesus Christ by faith. When you believe the gospel, cling to the gospel, rely upon the gospel, put your confidence in the gospel totally and fully, completely. So you see, salvation is not a reward for being good. Salvation is a gift that God gives to people, in fact, who are not good according to his standards. And it's only possible because of the cross of Jesus Christ. Were it not for the cross, there would be no salvation. Because at the cross, the Lord Jesus Christ died for my sins. He died for undeserving people. People who think wrong thoughts, who do wrong things, who have a past, who have baggage that they're carrying people who have addictions, people who swear and curse. He died for those who didn't deserve his death. And the Lord Jesus Christ offers us the free gift of salvation. Settle the matter of salvation. Make sure you're trusting in the right thing today, my friend. Dr. Lewis Perry Schaefer founded Dallas Seminary. He wrote part of the notes and some of the reference Bibles. And here's his description of salvation. Will you listen to this from the words of a great, great theologian? It is the work, salvation is the work of God for man, not the work of man for God. Salvation is get the giving of eternal life, not seeking to imitate Christ in ethical living. He said salvation is not saying what would Jesus do. It is saying what Jesus has done done for us. You see the difference? Salvation is God imparting or clothing us in his righteousness. It is not man offering his imperfect righteousness to God. Salvation is divine reconciliation. It's not human regulation. Salvation is God canceling my sin debt, not me trying to no longer sin. Salvation is divine regeneration, meaning to be born again, to have new life. Salvation is divine regeneration. It is not human reformation. It is being made acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. It is not me seeking to be made acceptable to God through my own works. And he said, lastly, salvation is always and only of God it is never of ourselves. In other words, it's 100% about what Jesus Christ did on the cross, that he died and canceled our sin debt, and for only one motivation, and that is because he loves us. He cares about us. He values us no matter who we are or what we have done. And then he stood one day and he said this, I am the way. And ladies and gentlemen, if Jesus is the only way to heaven, don't you try to make up your own way. You go by his way. You come to him and put your confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, a verse that used to bother me is one that's so familiar to people because Jesus said one day to that rich or to that young lawyer that came to him, he said to him, the lawyer said, what is the most important commandment of all? And what did Jesus say? He said that you love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your spirit. With all your heart, your soul, and your mind. Now listen to me for a minute. Every time I heard that, I had a pang because I knew I didn't do that. Now don't raise your hand. I'm not asking for a response because I don't want you to be embarrassed when you find out you shouldn't have. Does anybody here today love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind 24 7, 365? I doubt it. I doubt that anybody here could honestly raise your hand and say that you, in fact, do that. The old hymn says, Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Oh, I wish I loved him 100% of soul, body, and mind all the time. But I do know one thing I have discovered. I have found out how to love him. And I know that one of my big problems 
perhaps the major problem of my life is my heart drifting away and not loving Him with all my heart, soul, and mind. How do you love the Lord with all your heart, soul, and mind? You've never seen Him. He's invisible. How can I love some invisible being with all of my heart, soul, and mind? I'll tell you how. You go back to the cross. And you remember what He did for you there. Well, my mother didn't do that. My father didn't do it. My wife didn't do it. The best friend I ever had wouldn't do it. The congregation of the Florence Baptist Temple wouldn't go to the cross for me. The one thing that will motivate and provoke that love in your heart more than anything else is to tie down your salvation today that it is of God at the cross by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ by grace and through faith. I should get a better amen than that out of this crowd. I'll tell you that. That's pretty good right there, what I just said. Number two, settle the matter of your salvation. Number two, read God's Word daily. It is a complete diet. Now, remember that phrase, if you do these things, you will never fall. If you'll do these things, you won't fall. Your heart won't get cold. You won't drift away. You won't be one of the missing. Read God's Word daily. Daily, it is a complete diet. You know, Scripture is, the, is soul food. It feeds my soul. It feeds my heart. The Word of God is my nutritional uh, life uh, spiritually. It is the Christian's food, his diet. What do you think if, if I saw somebody come in the door out here and I, I said, how are you doing? Are you okay? Yeah, pretty, pretty sure I think I'm okay. Why do you ask? Well, you just you walked a little haltingly and, and you're a little pale. You look like you're weak. Are you okay? Well, I, I don't feel real good. Matter of fact, I do feel weak. I'm kind of sweaty just walking across the parking lot. Well, why do you think you're weak? Are, are you eating good? Well, you know, I eat one really good meal every Sunday morning. I chose Sunday morning for a specific reason there. You, under, you understand. I eat one big meal, man, I pig out every Sunday morning. But hold it. You can't live off of that. You can't be strong off of that. You've got to have God's Word daily. We have a little slogan here, and we use it all the time, and I want to remind you of it. Begin the day with the Bible in your lap. Why would you want to begin the day with the Bible? Why in the world would you want to, first thing out of the bed in the morning, pick up a 2,000-year-old book? I'll tell you why, because it's God's Word. And man shall not live by bread physically alone but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of Almighty God. Begin the day. It is your diet. It is your nutrition. You're going to get weak and anemic. You can't function with energy if you don't have God's Word hidden in your life and to hide it into your life and your heart and keep it in your mind. You're going to have to, you're going to, have to put out some effort. You're going to have to read it every day. 1 Peter chapter 2, the next chapter, calls the Word of God milk for the Christian. Hebrews chapter 5 calls it meat. Matthew chapter 4, Jesus called it bread. Psalm 119, David called it honey. Ephesians chapter 5 calls it water. I mean, it's a complete diet. There's just about everything there that we need, isn't there? And so today, read God's Word daily. Study the Word of God. It is a complete diet. Number three, six points for a successful Christian life. If you do these things, you shall never fall. Number three is pray. You knew that. These are simple things. They're almost as simple, so self-evident that I'm embarrassed to mention them to you. But you know, it's not that we need to always learn something new. We need to be reminded, don't we? Pray. How's your prayer life? You see, prayer, regular, consistent prayer, is your lifeline to God. It's your lifeline. 
I go up to the hospital and I visit someone and they have them on oxygen, or I go in a home and hear somebody on oxygen and they have this clear line running to them, they couldn't live without that oxygen giving them life. And in the same way, prayer is my lifeline. Somebody steps on that line. If that line is cut, if it's broken, if it's disconnected, then my fellowship with God is going to begin immediately to diminish. Prayer is just simply talking to God. Prayer is not using fancy phrases. Prayer is not formal conversation. I hear some people pray and I don't mean to be critical, but it sounds so formal. It sounds like an invitation to the king's tea party or something, you know. No, no. Prayer is just talking to the Lord. You see, the Bible says if you're a Christian, he's your heavenly father. Your heavenly father. So if he's your father, then talk to him like he's your father. You don't say to your father in this affected voice. You change your whole tone when you pray. I, I declared when I went in the ministry, I'm not going to have an ecclesiastical tone. You know, where when the preacher gets up, he changes his voice. You talk to him out here, he's got one voice, and he gets in the pulpit, he's got another voice. You know what I'm talking about? Are you all here today? Um, and then, you know, a guy talks normal, and then he says, Our Heavenly Father. And you say, oh, my, nobody talks to God like that. That's a performance. You say, Lord, I'm a needy person today. Lord, I have sinned, and I confess my sin. And, Lord, I have some things going on in my life, and I need you to come and help me. Lord, will you help me today? You talk to him. You stop and listen. You listen to him. Listen for that still, small voice within. You pray. Now there's conditions in the Bible that I don't have time to go into this morning. It, those conditions determine whether or not we get our prayers answered. But there's one condition above all others. You will never get a prayer answered if it doesn't meet this condition. There are four or five other conditions, but this is the condition above all conditions. And what is it? Your prayer must be in the will of God. It must not be selfish. James said that we consume it upon our own lust or desires. And so every prayer, before you pray, before you talk to the Lord, what would be the Lord's will? I want to talk to Him about the things that after reading and studying my Bible, I know would be His plan and His will. And He promised us that when we pray in His will, He will always answer our prayers. Pray the first thing in the morning. Oftentimes, I don't do it every morning, but most of the time, I pray before I get out of bed. I'm lying there, the alarm clock goes off, and before I ever even get up, I'll just whisper a little prayer in my heart to the Lord. Sometimes I just say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And I just go over the Lord's prayer. And I know it wasn't meant to be a rote prayer. It was a prayer where he taught us to pray. But it just about covers every area of life. And before I ever get up, not even audibly, just in my thoughts and in my heart, I speak to the Lord. Lord, help me today. Help me to live for you. Help me to love you like you want me to love you. Help me to please you. Keep me from the temptations that I'm subject to. Pray early. Begin the day with the Bible in your lap and begin the day with a word of prayer. It doesn't have to be a long prayer, but it has to be a genuine prayer. You know, most people tell me they pray at night. I don't, I don't know. I don't have a problem. I don't get into much trouble during the night when I'm sleeping. Do you? Don't wait till night and say, now, Lord, lay me down to sleep. No, you pray before the day begins. And depend upon the Lord. Depend upon the fact that he, in fact, heard that prayer. Number four, seek.
the filling of the Holy Spirit in your life. I'm afraid that so many, particularly Baptists, are afraid of that term, the Holy Spirit. They view that as some sort of fanaticism, some sort of excess, some sort of extremism. But I remind you that He is your source of power. The Holy Spirit is the energy source. The Holy Spirit in the Bible is always associated with energy, with action, with strength even. You know, we have the story in the Old Testament of Samson and it would talk about the Holy Spirit came upon him and then he would do these mighty, mighty deeds. And today, my usefulness to the Lord is not in my own intellectual capacity, my own experience. My usefulness to the Lord is in Him using me that the Holy Spirit indwells me and I've given Him control of my life. And I try every day to pray and ask the Lord, Lord, fill me. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. Now, what does it mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit? <clears throat> is it some sort of an emotional thing? No. Is it rolling on the floor? No. It has nothing to do with all that stuff. Being filled with the Holy Spirit, the word fill there has the idea of control. When I pray that the Lord will fill me with the Holy Spirit, you hear me pray it. I walk into the pulpit. Lord, fill me with the Spirit. What does that mean? It means that I'm asking Him to control my thoughts so that what I communicate to you will please Him. And I want Him to control even my gestures, my facial expression. I want every part of my being to be under the control of Him. And so I surrender to Him. I submit myself to Him. I say, Lord, you come and you be the driver. I'll move over and sit in the right seat. You drive the car in my life today. That's what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You don't need to be afraid of that. Do you think he's going to do something that would not be in your best interest? Do you think he's going to lead you in a wrong direction? Absolutely not. So seek the filling of the Holy Spirit. And there's a little formula that I've heard through the years that I use in my mind. How do I make sure that he will fill me? One, I confess every known sin to him. Every known sin. Anything that's on my conscience I confess it to him, and then I pray, and I say, Lord, now I'm depending upon you, and I want you to fill me and control me by your Holy Spirit today. All right, if you do these things, you shall never fall. You will be neither unfruitful nor barren in the work of the Lord and in your Christian life. Number one, settle the matter of your salvation. It will solve many of your problems. Number two, Read God's Word daily. It is your complete diet. Number three, pray. Regular, consistent prayer is your lifeline to God. Number four, seek the filling of the Holy Spirit. He is your source of power. Number five is get involved in the local church. It is God's will and plan for every single Christian. I made a study of the New Testament one time. That I was going to talk to somebody about this because they were sort of deprecating church membership and church involvement. They were one of these people that they were very well-taught Christian, but a little bit super pious. And their attitude was, I'm not sure that you need the local church as much as you emphasize it. You can kind of do it on your own. And I went through the New Testament. I cannot find in the New Testament a single Christian that did not relate his life to the local church. My term for it became that there aren't any Lone Ranger Christians. By Lone Ranger, I mean people who think, I don't need the church. Uh, the idea today is it's just Jesus and me. If I'm okay with Jesus, I'm okay. Am I not, preacher? No, that's not the whole thing. That is a small part of it. You see, the Lord, the, the local church is God's idea. That wasn't my idea. That's not an invention of the preachers to manipulate you. The Bible talks about the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, I will build my church. I founded my church. I did it with my blood. I purchased it with my very blood. Read Ephesians chapter 5. 
And when the Bible talks about the church, it's talking about a group. It's talking about a corporate thing. It's not an individual thing. We have today in America, Charles Colson wrote extensively using a term he said, he talked about radical individualism. Radical individualism. Now, now I, I'll tell you what, I like American you know, individualism. This idea that, you know, don't tread on me. This idea that, that uh, I'm going to make it on my own. I'm not going to depend upon the government and everybody else. Man, I'm all for that. But when it comes to the Lord's work, I'm going to tell you, you can't make it on your own. That's why the Lord brought into his plan his church, his local church, too, is what I'm talking about here. And how does the Bible refer to it? It refers to it as a family, a family. And many of us have discovered that we're as close to people here, our brothers and sisters in Christ, as we are to our own family members sometimes. The Scripture in other places refers to the church as an army, an army, mobilized, organized, so we can get something done. You know, the difference in an army and a mob, somebody said, is just simply organization. And, and we won't ever carry out the cause of Jesus Christ without an army, a mobilized force that is trained and organized to achieve certain goals, the Great Commission and other things that he's given us to do. And the idea of just Jesus and me philosophy is, is, is just patently wrong, folks. Now, you know what? We're seeing that everywhere. And we're particularly saying, my apologies to the younger generation here, but we're particularly seeing it among you. I went to a political gathering the other night, and my daughter said to me as we sat there, do you know what's wrong with this? Everybody here is your age, Dad. We know that the young people don't vote in the same numbers that the older generation votes. We know today that civic club membership is at an all-time low in America because we're the most connected people in the world with our cell phone and our computer and our texting, and we're the least connected that we've been in the life of this country when it comes to personal relationship. And this radical individualism idea, and I'm really preaching now, am I not? This radical individualism idea, boy, it's so true. You know why I know it's true? I call you on the phone, I know you where you are, and you won't even answer your phone. I knock on your door, and I hear you say, shh, the preacher's at the door. We don't even have the common courtesy of being sensitive to other people anymore. We're losing it in America where we have this idea that we're part of a whole, we're part of a community. And it's all about my schedule. I'm too busy. I don't have time for other people. And the church of the Lord Jesus Christ just absolutely reigns on that idea, doesn't it? It would take away a lot of the coarseness in our society because in the church we have to learn to love each other. You know, one of the things I think is so good about the church nobody ever says is if you stay, you're going to have to learn to forgive because somebody around here is going to dent your fender. In fact, they're not going to dent your fender. They're going to wreck you. It's going, you're going to get totaled one day. And you know what? God made it like that. Now, about 95% of the Christians, you know what they do? They get their fender dented just a little bit, and they walk out and say, I'll find me another church. But the truth is, is the Lord wants you to learn to get along and forgive and love and uh, deal with those kinds of things with the love of Jesus Christ. So he puts us in this community. And this is his idea. Something happens when we worship together. The 
It doesn't happen when you worship by yourself. It's a different thing. It's not better or worse. It's just different. Corporate worship is different. And the Lord said to do it, to not forsake assembling together. And then there's the fellowship. And there's the discipleship that I can't do on my own. And there's the evangelism. And there's the missions, all these flags that we've been talking about with the missions conference. How long do you think missions would last across this world if we didn't have churches? I might can support one or two missionaries, but the world will never be reached without the church. And ministry to one another and learning to love each other, even when we're offended, as I said, that's number five. Be involved in the church that you never fall. And the last one, number six, is witnessing. Witnessing. And I want to tell you, it's God's command for every believer. But they also tell me that in America today, about 90% of the professing Christians never witness. We're ashamed. Or we're reluctant. Or we are afraid that we will offend. And oh, the need is greater than it's ever been. May I just tell you in about two minutes the need? The need is that one in four adults in America today identify themselves as nuns. Meaning on a religious checklist, rather than saying Baptist, Presbyterian, Catholic, Methodist, Pentecostal, whatever, they check none. They mean no religious affiliation at all. That's one out of four. That's 25% of the country. It's not as true in South Carolina, but it's true across America. You would would be overwhelmed if you went to our larger cities and saw how few people even go to church anymore. We are rapidly becoming an unchurched country. The statistics tell us that many of those nuns are really functionally atheist. It's not that they just don't go. They they may claim that they believe in God, but functionally, they live like an atheist. They live as if there were no God. And it's not that they so much reject the idea of God, the research tells us. They are not rejecting God in religion. They are just not thinking about it. They're so caught up with the affairs of this life that they don't have time to give it any thought. And when we go down the next generation, Generation Z, the people under 25, it's the first generation we've ever had in America that was raised in a post-Christian culture, largely biblically illiterate. Many of them say they believe in God, but barely. And frightfully, their thinking processes have been shaped by the media. And you know what? Some of them are your friends. And if you don't lead them to Christ, nobody else will. You're the, you may be the only real Christian in their circle. Witness, it's God's command. And if you do these things, you will never fall. In fact, there's so many benefits because the answer to worry is God's Word. And the answer to pressure and stress in life is prayer. And the answer to fear is faith. And the answer to guilt is grace. And the answering to grumbling is gratitude. And when I don't worry and I'm not stressed out, and I'm not fearful, and I'm not in bondage to guilt, and I have a thankful attitude, boy, life can be good. I may have problems, but I'm not overwhelmed and defeated. The six-point plan, if you do them, you will not fall. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed.